Welcome everyone. We have a very exciting episode today. This is one of my favorite episodes to do because I find it so interesting. We have these rules and regulations that say if you're managing over $100 million of money, then you need to declare what you've been investing in every single quarter. So we get to look back and see how all these super investors portfolios looked like by the end of Q4. We get a glimpse at what they've been doing with their money, how they've been managing their portfolios, what type of companies they're either buying or selling. And the list of super investors that we're going to be going over in this video, I think I think it's the concentration of some of the best investors in the world. We have legendary Warren Buffett with Berkshire Hathaway. We have Terry Smith the high quality value investor. We have Pat Dorsey. He's the one that came up with the Morningstar moat rating. We have Bill Ackman. Of course, everybody knows about Bill Ackman. He's all over the media. Then we have Josh Tarasov. He's a lesser known investor. He runs a smaller portfolio, very tech focused. We have Chris Hone. Remember Chris Hone, the guy that said you should fire another 30,000 employees, Google? He's the one that's really concentrated into Google, urging them to fire more employees. Uh, Google employees don't like Chris Hone. Then we have Manish Pabrai. He's one of the ones that's all around social media. He runs an extremely concentrated portfolio. We have Chuck Acri. He's one of the ones that has that, that three-legged stool approach where he focuses on companies that have very high returns on capital over long periods of time and very good management. So I'm excited to check out Chuck Acri's. Then we have Daniel Loeb. He's He's been around for a while with Third Point. His fund has been doing okay. I wanna see what he's doing now. We have Christopher Bloomstrand. He's the guy that understands Berkshire Hathaway and the business like no one else. He really understands it to a, an extensive degree. And then of course, last but not least, we have Michael Burry, one of the most interesting investors of our day. So we have a full list of super investors to go over. And rather than just looking at specifically what companies are buying and selling, We'll be looking at that, but I also want to go over what I think is the reasoning, the methodology, what's going on in their heads behind these purchases. So I've studied these individuals a lot. I've tried to reverse architect why they make the decisions they have, and I'll be going over that and sharing what I can with all their portfolios. Now let's go ahead and jump right in. We'll start off with, of course, Warren Buffett. First, before even jumping into his most recent trades, I want to take a look at Warren Buffett's portfolio and just reiterate a couple points here. And by the way, this website we're looking at, where you can see the most recent uh, trades that they've done, it's called dataroma.com. So that's where you go to if you want to visit this website. I have no affiliation with it, but we have Warren Buffett's portfolio right here. This is Berkshire Hathaway. When I look at his portfolio, the common trends that I see are companies that earn very high returns on tangible assets. That's a key metric that Warren Buffett looks at. Another way of looking at something similar is return on capital employed. That's another thing that Warren Buffett has talked about repeatedly. He also likes financials. He's also okay investing in energy companies at very low prices. But I would say that a very common theme is that he loves toll bridges. He loves companies that just earn a fee for basically doing nothing over and over again. Think about Apple as his top holding. The growth of Apple, the storyline with Apple, is the toll bridge of the App Store. All their digital purchases, monetizing all of their users. They have that digital toll bridge. Then you have, you have so many companies. You have Moody's Corporation. They're a toll bridge on all of the credit rating that goes on. Uh, you have VeriSign. That's another toll bridge company. We have MasterCard. That company's for sure a toll bridge. We have Visa, that company's a toll bridge, duopolies. So he loves these type of monopolistic toll bridge businesses that make up a large part of his portfolio. But at the heart of it, Warren Buffett is a value investor. He's a quality investor. He buys high quality companies and he tries to buy them at very low prices. Now, one of the things that was a little bit shocking is if we look at his trades here, I don't know if you can see this. Let me zoom in. In Q3 of 2022, he made this big purchase, and we can organize by percent change the portfolio. The biggest change that he made to his portfolio was this right here, buying into TSM, Taiwan Semiconductor. This was a purchase that a lot of people were happy to see. They thought this was a great company. And when I went over the reasons of why Warren Buffett bought into this company, I thought it was quite obvious. I thought the reason was is because TSM gets around 20 to 30% of its overall revenue from Apple. They manufacture the semi for Apple. So 
I just thought of it as more of like an arm of Apple, basically an extension of Apple and more, more like vertically integrating the Apple supply chain. So it made sense that he was purchasing this company. But then what we see is the very next quarter, Q4 of 2022, which is the most recent one, he sold. Buffett or Berkshire, whoever's doing these buys and sells, sold nearly the entire stake. They sold 86% of the position. And this was confusing for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's just not often that you see Berkshire Hathaway buying into a company and then selling it the very next quarter. That is rare. They are a buy and hold investor. They buy into things for life. They want to hold companies like Coca-Cola that they can hold for 20, 30 plus years. Seize candy that Buffett has had his entire career. Those are the type of purchases they're trying to do. So seeing them basically buy into a company and then the very next quarter, one quarter later, sell out of it is incredibly rare for Berkshire Hathaway. And it is confusing. I've looked up and tried to see if there's any specific reason why they did this. I, I searched everything I could. There is no official statement by Berkshire or any of the lieutenants of why they would do this. When I try to think of the possible reasons why, there's a couple possible reasons. One of them is maybe it just went up in price. Well, that reason of it running up in price doesn't really make sense either. This is Q3 right here. The number three, these red bars are where Q3 is. That's where they purchased their stake. And then Q4 is where they sold. So it would be difficult for them to have bought in much lower and sold much higher. Now, they could have feasibly bought in right here at the bottom of Q4 and then sold again at the top of Q4, locking in like a 20, 30% gain. But that's, again, very unusual for Berkshire Hathaway. I can't imagine them doing this very short-term trading of buying in and then two weeks later selling out. It's just not typical. It doesn't follow their investing thesis. So I think the idea that they just bought in and then they quickly sold out at a gain, I think that that's not likely. More than likely, my opinion on this TSM debacle and what happened here is I think they bought in and then they learned new information that changed their mind. They probably learned about some new threat, maybe a political threat. Uh, maybe there's something about the company that they didn't realize before. I think there's something that basically spooked them out of the holding and they just sold when they learned new information. Now, again, this is a guess. I don't know for sure. We'll have to ultimately wait and see what they did. But I don't think that Berkshire is short-term traders. I don't think that they quickly bought in and locked in a 10% gain. That's not how they operate. It's not how they look at companies. I'm also inclined to believe that this wasn't Warren Buffett himself. I would have to guess that this is one of the lieutenants, Ted or Todd, someone else at the organization that really did this trade in the first place and then they found out new info and changed their mind. Because I don't believe that Warren Buffett is doing research on semiconductor companies and figuring out which one has a durable competitive advantage. It's just not something I see Warren Buffett doing. So ultimately we'll have to wait and find out maybe the next Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting. Right now it's up to speculation, but this is unusual for Berkshire Hathaway. I don't think it's a good look. I think trading in and out of positions like that is not a good thing. I've done it with my portfolio. I've made mistakes where I bought into companies and I traded out soon after, but I'm not Berkshire Hathaway. This is supposed to be a, a legendary investment club that they're part of here. So I don't wanna see them do this more frequently. I think if they're doing this, this type of event all the time, that would be something concerning. But right now it's only one trade, one time, and I, I believe it was only one and a half percent of their portfolio. So not a huge stake in the grand scheme of things. Now, the other parts of their portfolio, they basically sold out of USB Corp. That didn't move the stock a lot. We have them selling half of their Bank of New York Mellon Corp, and they reduced their Activision Blizzard bet again. So they are, I think, slowly reducing out of Activision Blizzard, and it's probably because of Lena Khan and I think the DOJ stepping in and trying to disrupt these type of mergers. I think that there's gonna be a lot more intense scrutiny of it than expected, and there's a chance that it won't go through. That's the only way that I see Warren Buffett selling out of this. So we have those trades as well. Other than that, the things that they're buying right now, they bought a smidget more of Apple, a tiny fraction more. I wouldn't read into that too much. They bought a little bit more of Paramount as well, and then they bought 21% more 
of Louisiana Pacific Corp. So a couple buys there as well. So overall, not much action in Warren Buffett's portfolio. The turnover, the total turnover last quarter was 2%. So not a huge change. And the most shocking thing by far was that TSM sell. I'm going to be trying to figure out more information on that. But as of right now, we know what we know which is not a lot. Now, moving on, we have another legendary investor that I think is a, a fantastic investor. And I've learned a lot from him and reading about him and reading about his history, which is Terry Smith. If you haven't, I would recommend picking up this book from Amazon. It's called Investing for Growth. And it's basically a compilation of all of Terry Smith's writings, all of his letters, everything that he's, all of his biggest thoughts on investing over the, the past decade. And you learn a lot about just different investing concepts, like buybacks. When are they good? When are they bad? When are dividends good? When are they bad? Uh, what type of growth you should be looking for in companies? What type of growth is bad? Right? He just goes through and he dissects a lot of the teachings from Warren Buffett, but in a more descriptive and specific way. Warren Buffett speaks in a lot of generalities. He's very vague, very nebulous. He says things like, buy good companies and hold long term. Terry Smith defines what a good company is with specific measurements, with specific things that you can look up for a good company. So I view Terry Smith as a teacher that breaks down what Warren Buffett is saying, and he breaks vague terms into very specific outlining prescriptive definitions. So I would pick up this book. I think it's well worth the read. But let's go ahead and take a look at what Terry Smith is doing. Now, the first thing that I'll note is Terry Smith's overall portfolio. He is called a quality investor. I call him a value investor because even though he focuses on high quality companies, he still is looking for value. He's looking for companies that will outgrow other companies and the price that you're paying will be well worth it in five to 10 years because of the level of organic growth a company has. So he has a lot of companies that were expensive five years ago and 10 years ago, like Microsoft, but they broadly outperformed the market. They've done it by a wide degree. Estee Lauder is another company that's always an expensive company, but it's crushed the market over the past 50 years. And these are the type of companies he buys into. Very high quality companies with good brand value, high returns on capital employed. They're usually not too capital intensive. So they're businesses that run with very high margins. They have super high gross margins, super high operating and profit margins. We have companies like ADP, McCormick, Pepsi, Visa, Mettler, Toledo, Nike, Adobe, Church and Dwight, so on and so forth. All of these quality companies he focuses on, he buys and holds them long term. Now, what we see here, and you can see it right on the screen, he's basically reducing every single holding. If I go over to the activity feed here, I filter by the changes to the portfolio, we can see what's going on. Look at all these cells. He's selling like his entire portfolio last quarter. When I see this, there's something that you have to realize. These guys are running funds that lots of other businesses and other individuals that are very wealthy are investing in. For example, Terry Smith's portfolio right now, it's around $21 billion. That's not his money. That's other people's money that he's managing. Now life happens and some of these people need to pull money out of the market from time to time. So if I'm some wealthy billionaire and I want to go buy myself a mansion or something, I can pull out a billion dollars out of Terry Smith's fund and the way that he produces that cash is by selling off part of his holdings. So I believe that this is redemptions. I think that there's some people basically pulling out a little bit of money. And Terry Smith is spreading the selling across his entire portfolio. So instead of selling out of one company in particular, he's saying, okay, you want 500 million back or a billion back, I'll sell a smidget of every single holding. Just trim the portfolio overall. So when I see these 0.11 reductions, 0.9 reductions. This has nothing to do with the intrinsic value or fundamental of these companies. This is simply redemptions and him trimming all of these positions to raise cash. If I look at what's a meaningful sell, he already outlined a couple of these in his letter, but he sold completely out of PayPal. 100% sell. That was about 2.29% of the portfolio. So a meaningful position. And he wrote that he was very disappointed with the way that PayPal was treating customers. They weren't, really, they weren't really focusing on high quality customers. Also, PayPal was not communicating well with Terry Smith. He had questions. He had, he had things that he was asking for the company and they just weren't, 
they weren't responding in a way that he liked. So he exited that company. Now, the other company that Terry Smith sold completely out of his entire stake, which is 3% of his portfolio, a meaning holding for him because he doesn't run a very concentrated portfolio. He has a lot of companies. So a 3% stake is a meaningful one. He sold entirely out of Intuit. They're the ones that own QuickBooks, they own TurboTax, and they own MailChimp. So they own a lot of the at home doing taxes and running your own home business software. The actual suite of software that Intuit owns, I think is great. I, I think it's a lot of great tools. I think, the, I think the business overall is fantastic. But what did Terry Smith not like about this company? Well, he didn't like the fact that they were trying to mask their true profitability by altering metrics and making it look like they're much more profitable than they actually are. For example, Intuit's another one of these companies that I've highlighted so many times with the deceptive metrics that they use. They generate a lot of free cash flow and the free cash flow is growing quickly. That's a good thing, that's a positive. But also they're growing their stock-based comp and dilution at an equally fast rate. You can see the purple bar here is basically half of their free cash flow. And what Intuit did in their financial reports that Terry Smith really hated and he called out directly is Intuit tried to calculate their earnings and their profitability without factoring in the stock-based comp or dilution. And he thinks that that's very deceptive. Now, I agree with him on this. I think it is a deceptive practice. I hope companies will change from doing this. I've been highlighting this many times on my channel, but it is what it is. A lot of companies are trying to get away with this and they'll continue to as long as they're allowed to. Having said that, I do think that Intuit's a great company. When I look at the franchise of assets they have, I really think it's good. So even though it's an expensive company, even though they do dilution, I actually think the company itself and the products they have are really good. But overall, we can see that Terry Smith has a couple meaningful sales, Intuit and PayPal, and then he purchased in to IEX Corp, just a smidget, 0.18% of the portfolio. And there's a couple other buys. He bought a little bit more Apple. So he's still buying that, but that's again, 0.01% of the portfolio. So not too many meaningful trades for Terry Smith. He sold out of a couple companies and he bought a little bit more of a couple companies. And then overall, it looks like he had a redemption. So he trimmed his overall portfolio. Now, next up, we have an investor called Pat Dorsey. He became famous after coming up with the Morningstar moat rating. So you know how Morningstar has the wide moat or narrow moat or no moat, that whole rating that made Morningstar kind of popular doing that? Well, Pat Dorsey is the one that really put that together. And he put it together by becoming obsessed with Warren Buffett and studying what makes a moat of a company. Having said that, there's lots of investors that claim to want to follow Warren Buffett's advice. They say that they're investing just like Warren Buffett. And then you look at their portfolios and you can tell they're nothing like Warren Buffett's or any type of company that Warren Buffett would buy. And this to me is Pat Dorsey. He's someone that claims to be a Warren Buffett value investor but I'm not impressed with this performance. I'm not impressed with his portfolio or his holdings. I, I just don't like him. What can I say? I, I, I don't like the way that he invests. Now, I'm sure he's a nice person, nothing against him personally, but me, I, I don't like the portfolio or the way that he values and invests in these different companies. Let's go ahead and take a look at what he's actually buying. The first one is Smartsheet, all right? Smartsheet's number one, S-M-A-R. Smartsheet's one of these cloud platforms that automate some, some work metrics. If we look at the past performance of it, this is a company that's down 44% over the past couple of years. It's a company that's growing quickly in revenue, one of these SaaS companies that loses money every single quarter, doesn't generate any free cash flow, has excessive amounts of stock-based comp. It's, the net income is negative, the earnings per share are negative, and it's one of the companies that continually dilutes investors, going from 100 million shares to 130 million shares. Is this the type of company that you would ever catch Warren Buffett buying? Never. You would never see Warren Buffett buying Smartsheet. I would be, I, I wouldn't believe it. I, you would have to slap me and make me wake up because I would never be able to believe that Warren Buffett would buy this company. So this is what I'm saying when I say that many investors act like they are following Warren Buffett's advice, but in practice, when you look at their portfolios, they're not, they're simply not. Warren Buffett would never buy this company. Another one that we can look at here, Wix. This is a company that I did analysis on. It's an okay company. It has a decent product. It's one of these website builder e-commerce companies, very similar to Squarespace. In fact, I believe it's basically a commodity with Squarespace and with all the other companies that do the same thing. It's up 17% year to date, so it's having a good run right now. 
Over the past two years, it's down 71%. He bought into this company many quarters ago at a much higher price. So he's been crushed on this company. And again, a so-called Warren Buffett following investor, we have a company that grows revenue rapidly, that loses money in EBITDA, that loses money in free cash flow, net income, so on and so forth, that heavily dilutes the investors, printing off shares and, and giving it away like it's candy. This is not the Warren Buffett way. If you're not going to be following Warren Buffett, that's fine, but don't claim that you're following Warren Buffett because these are not investments he would make. So overall, I don't like the portfolio. I don't like the methodology. I'd never give my money to him to manage. And I don't think that his portfolio resembles Warren Buffett at all. Some of the companies I don't mind here, I think Google looks good. I think Disney's an okay play. I, the same with Meta. I think these are okay plays. But then their top holdings, I think, are very speculative, weak companies that he's likely to get crushed on like he, like he did with Wix. So if we look at the biggest changes to his portfolio last quarter, he closed a position of Poshmark because the company was taken private, so he had to. And then Meta was a, a big purchase, 4% of the portfolio. So a relatively big purchase, but not a huge one. He bought a little bit more Meta and that company's done well. So that's been a good trade so far. Wix has not been great. He sold out of the holding a little bit, reduced it by 14%. Smartsheet's another one that he added to, Roku he added to, and the rest of the holdings are basically flat. So overall, I think a good trade with Meta, give him credit for that. Other than that, I don't love the portfolio construction. He's not someone that I'd be following his trades with my money. Now, next up, we have Bill Ackman. This is an investor that most people know about. Bill Ackman is a very popular super investor. He's one of the ones that used to be a very activist investor. He used to get more involved in companies. He would short companies and come out with huge thesis on it. Uh, he would also try to get board seats, take over companies, implement changes in CEOs and so forth. And he's not as exciting anymore. He's not doing quite as much of that. Now what he typically does is he runs a very concentrated portfolio into a few good growth type of companies. And he basically tries to hedge his portfolio against downturns. That seems to be what he's doing now. When I look at Bill Ackman's portfolio overall, I think it's actually good. He's concentrated into a lot of quality companies, Lowe's being the first one. Lowe's and Home Depot have a little bit of a duopoly. Both of them I think will be very successful. He picked Lowe's out a number of years ago. And the reasoning was, is basically Lowe's was behind Home Depot and he thought that Lowe's could catch up to Home Depot in both market share and margins and that type of thing. And they have. Lowe's has outperformed Home Depot a little bit over the past decade. So this is a massive holding, 24% of the portfolio, one fourth of it into Lowe's, and he's holding strong on that. No changes there. The next one is QSR, Restaurant Brands International. This is one that I don't love as much. I think there's better restaurants. Uh, this is Burger King, which I just don't think is a quality brand. I don't consider it quality food. I'd rather invest in probably something like McDonald's, but this one is, I think is trading at a lower valuation. So he has 18% into this one. I think out of his whole portfolio, this is probably the weakest holding. The next up we have Chipotle, which has been a big bet by Bill Ackman, a big win by him. He was buying this one in 2015 and 2016 after the whole E. coli outbreak. A lot of people got food poisoning. The brand value of Chipotle got diminished and it had a revival. And here we are, Chipotle's chugging along and it's a very strong brand value now, very strong company, 18% into that one. So these are massive, massive holdings, very concentrated. The next one after that is a real estate company called Howard Hughes Corp. This is one that he has special deals. I don't understand all of it, but what I've read, basically I get the impression that Bill Ackman has unique deals and unique things he's doing with this real estate company that not everyone else has access to. So I don't think I could really follow him into this holding because I think he's trying to carve out with his ownership some unique deals that benefit him. The last one, but also a very significant holding, and this is one that's relatively new to the portfolio, is Canadian Pacific. And Canadian Pacific is a company that I actually share with Bill Ackman right now. I hold this company as well. I view it as a company that has obviously a massive moat, a big network effect. I think it has a long path for growth. And then they have the deal where they're going to be expanding their rail network by doing acquisitions so that they can go all the way from Canada through the US into Mexico with a single rail network. 
That's something that hasn't happened before, which should give this company a lot of pricing power over the next decade. So that's part of the reason he's buying into this company, as well as the leadership has been very proven. Look at the look at the metrics of Canadian Pacific over the past 10 years. Look at the free cash flow growth. It is outstanding. So if they advance their rail network and they have the same leadership, it's basically, it's just easy to outline or underwrite a thesis where this company will have continued margin expansion. But overall, I think that Bill Ackman is a legitimate investor. He has beat the market for over 20 years. He hedges his portfolio pretty effectively, and he has a concentrated portfolio into companies that I think are high quality companies. So I, I think his opinions are interesting. He's on Twitter all the time talking about different subjects. I don't always agree with him, but I think he is a legitimate investor. Now, the next investor we're going to be looking at is called Josh Tarasov. He's a little bit lesser known. He runs a smaller portfolio of only $200 million. Now, that seems like a lot of money, but keep in mind that most of these investors run portfolios of $20 billion. So they're orders of magnitude bigger than Josh Tarasov's. But... Either way, I think he's interesting to look at what he's doing. He's had a lot of success with companies in the past, like Amazon in particular. When I look at his portfolio, there's just selling across the board. He only really bought two companies in the last quarter, and he reduced a stake in all of them aside from these two companies. What I believe happened over the past quarter is he had redemptions. He was invested in a lot of companies that didn't do well over the past year. Amazon is down big, 50%. That's a big chunk of his portfolio. Salesforce is down big. That's a big chunk of his portfolio. Netflix is down big. Spotify is down big. Monday's down big. Shopify is down big. Google's even down. So half of his portfolio was down a lot. I don't know his total returns, but basically every company that he was buying into over the past year, all these tech companies went down. And I think that that makes your investors a little bit scared. A lot of them might want to pull their money out. They might feel a little a little shook from that happening. So you see this fund having redemptions and he's forced to sell out of a lot of holdings. Now, I actually hold a lot of these same companies. I'm bullish on Amazon, I'm bullish on Salesforce and Google and Netflix, these are big holdings of mine. But the difference between me and Josh Tarasoff is I don't manage other people's money. That's not how I make money, is by taking in funds and charging an asset under management or performance fee. And that gives me the luxury of not having to worry about redemptions. My holdings can go down, and as long as I'm fine financially, I can just hang on to them. So I've just held on to companies like Netflix, held on to companies like Amazon and Salesforce, and time is on my side. I can wait three, five, 10 years and see these companies recover over time. But when you're in the business of managing other people's money, you have to worry about short-term volatility and other investors changing their minds. So I think that's the reason we see all of this selling. I would assume that he's still bullish on most of these companies, that he's not really changed his mind on them. The company that he actually added to was Brookfield Corp and Brookfield Asset Management. So those are the only ones that he's buying. I've looked at these companies before. I think they're very high quality. So I could see why he wants them in his portfolio. So I have to imagine this hasn't been a particularly fun past year for Josh Tarasoff. He's having, I think, a, a lot of doubt with his investors doing these redemptions. And I think it's difficult for fund managers to both maintain a long-term perspective while also running a business, a business where they basically have to try to take assets under management and keep all of their investors happy. The advantage of an individual investor, if you're just managing your own money, you don't have to worry about other investors pulling their money out. When I'm managing my own portfolios, I manage them based off of what I wanna do. So if I don't wanna sell Netflix, if I don't wanna sell Amazon, I don't have to. And no other investor can change my mind on that. So I think that's an advantage that the individual investor has over these big wigs. Now, having said that, the next investor we're gonna be looking at is one that I think is particularly good. And he has had awards for being one of the, the best performing investment hedge funds over the past decade. He's crushed the market, outperformed it by over double. His name is Chris Hone. Now, I've done a couple of videos on him before. He's most notable for basically writing a letter to Sundar Pichai of Google and telling him to fire 30,000 more employees. A lot of people were upset at Chris Hone, saying that he's this uncaring, unloving person. Why would he want all these Google employees to be fired? That's a bad thing. They, they refer to him as a vulture capitalist, right? Like he just wants to go in and raid businesses for all their worth. The other side of this is that Chris Hone runs a fund called the TCI Fund. TCI Fund stands for the Children's Investment Fund. 
The reason that he named it the Children's Investment Fund is because this massive $30 billion fund is heavily centered around philanthropy. It is a philanthropic fund. What he does is part of the assets under management goes right to charity. So unlike a lot of people that decide to give away all their money to charity after they're dead, Chris Hone is giving away a ton of money and raising a ton of money for charity. So basically the way that Chris Hone looks at this is he's trying to generate as much money as possible, much profit as possible from these great companies. And then he's redirecting a lot of this money back to charity to help children that are hungry, to help children that are underprivileged, to try to build schools and lift other people up. So you can look at him as a vulture capitalist because he's saying that Google employees should, they should trim down on their, their amount of employees. Or you can look at him as a charitable person because he's directing billions and billions of dollars back to charity to help children. Whatever perspective you look at is up to you, but that's just the background of him. He's very focused on philanthropy. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and dive into this portfolio and try to observe the type of investments he's making and why these have so outperformed the market. He's really crushed the market with these type of companies. So let's go ahead and go through it. The first two companies on the list are Microsoft and Google. And Google is actually number one because he split up the investment between the two different tickers. If you add them together, he has 20% into Google, 17%, almost 18 into Microsoft. So he has around 35% of his portfolio into these two companies, two big tech companies that I would describe as highly monopolistic, very wide moat businesses that are highly profitable. That's 30, 35% of his portfolio. Massive holdings into these two companies. Then we get to the next 30% of his portfolio. We have Canadian National Railway, a class one railroad company. And we have Canadian Pacific Railway, another class one railroad company. So we have 35% of the portfolio and two big tech companies that are wide moat monopolistic companies with very high profitability. Then we have the next 30% of his portfolio and the two incredibly wide moat companies, very monopolistic in nature. And these are also very profitable companies. Moving on, we have Visa, another monopolistic wide moat company. It's a duopoly with uh, MasterCard. So he really loves these type of monopolistic businesses. Furthermore, we move down the list and we have S&P Global. These are the type of companies that I've been shifting my portfolio more to. S&P Global is another incredibly wide moat business, almost indestructible in my opinion. Moody's is just a, another arm of this type of company. These are the credit rating agencies. They form a duopoly together. Then we have after that, Thermo Fisher Scientific, another very wide moat company in the healthcare industry. This one's just a smidget. 0.12%. So I would not really pay attention to this holding yet. It's barely on the radar. And then for whatever reason, he sold out of Union Pacific, probably to raise more funds for these type of companies up here. When I look at this portfolio, I think, I, I don't know what other word to describe it other than bulletproof. One of the strongest portfolios I've seen. This is a collection of incredibly wide moat monopolistic businesses that have high amounts of profitability that generate very predictable free cash flows. When I look at his portfolio, I also want to take note of the type of companies he doesn't have in his portfolio. And I think this is equally intentional. I think what he has in the portfolio is just as meaningful as what he doesn't have in it. He does not have any company with a weak moat. Doesn't matter how cheap it is. He does not buy companies that do not have a long-term, durable, sustainable, competitive advantage. So this is someone that I would say is more akin to following Buffett's investments than someone like Pat Dorsey. I think his portfolio much more resembles that type of investing. He also doesn't have any company, interestingly enough, that does any type of logistics or manufactures anything or really even makes anything. I guess Microsoft makes a couple pieces of hardware, Google does as well, but that's the minority of their business. These are service businesses. He doesn't own Apple. Apple designs and manufactures a, a lot of hardware. They have to worry about logistics. They have to worry about pricing and commodities and you know the price of these different rare earth metals. He doesn't own Nike. They have to make shoes, they have to make shirts, they have to manufacture stuff. They have to worry about logistics and shipping and different extrinsic factors. He doesn't have a single company that makes anything. All of these are service companies. Google, all they make is money. They make money by search and by YouTube. They're not making anything physical. The same with Microsoft. There's no logistics concerns with Microsoft. 
The same thing with Canadian Pacific and Canadian National Railway. These are service companies, huge network service companies that just ship things around. They're not making the stuff that they're shipping. Visa is another service-oriented company, does not make anything physical. Same with S&P Global, same with Moody, same with uh, even Thermo Fisher Scientific is mostly, it's mostly data and it's mostly service-oriented. So I think that's an intentional part of his portfolio. So when I try to reverse architect what has made his portfolio so successful over time, I think it's the focus on incredibly strong, durable companies with long-term competitive advantages. And I think it's also the focus on companies that don't have all the risks of supply chains, of manufacturing, of commodity prices. These companies don't have to worry about all those different risk factors. They can keep churning out cash flow year after year after year. So my opinion, I really like this portfolio. I share many of the same holdings and many of the same, I think, overall investment philosophy. So he's someone that I follow for sure. I think it's a just strong all around. I think it will continue to outperform the market. That'd be my guess. Now, next up, we have an investor most people are familiar with, who is Manish Babrai. Manish Babrai, I think, has an incredibly impressive background, coming from the poor country of India and turning himself into a multimillionaire multiple times over in the U.S. That's a story I can get behind. That is the American dream. It's, it's, I, I, you know, rags to riches. That type of thing, I think, is incredible. And I think that he has so much knowledge to share. You listen to his YouTube videos and he talks about investing. He shares stories of being friends with Charlie Munger. He talks about different investing philosophies and different ideas. And I think overall, he's an incredibly positive, fun, good influence in the world. So I really like Manish Pabrai. Having said that, I would discourage anyone from really trying to mimic and follow his portfolio because it's just so concentrated and I think that most investors will find themselves in trouble because they don't have the same mentality or thoughts that Manish Parai does. So we look at his portfolio and I look at it from afar. I keep a distance from it. I look at what he's doing and I find it interesting, but I am not going to be jumping into the same holdings he has or trying to follow and reverse architect what he's doing. He basically is, he's so heavy into Micron technology. So one company, he has a thesis on it. He thinks it's basically monopolistic. He thinks this company is way undervalued and he has 77% of his US portfolio in the company. Now this only shows US holdings. So he does have some other investments like a proxy for Tencent. Uh, so it's a little bit more diversified than what you see here. But regardless, this is a very large holding. Then he had Brookfield Corp. This is one that he added and he tripled the position of this one to 18% of the US portfolio. Brookfield Asset Management, this is another buy he introduced into the portfolio. He likes these asset manager type of companies. So overall, I, his portfolio is not one that I would mimic. I'm not gonna be following it. I'm much more, if I had to decide between putting my money with Monish Babrai and Christopher Hone, I'd pick Christopher Hone. That's much more in line with my thoughts. I think if you're going to follow this type of investing, going all in these type of companies, I think you're asking for trouble if you're doing that. Now, after Bonish Prabhai, we have the investor Chuck Acre. He's a great investor that has had market beating returns. And even his public ETF has outperformed the S&P 500 for the past, I think, like 12 years now. So he's been outperforming for a long period of time. And he's done it with such a simple investment philosophy. He refers to it as the three-legged stool. Leg one, you need to find companies that are extraordinary businesses. Companies like Terry Smith defines as earning high returns on capital companies with very wide moats. So you need to find those companies. And then two, you need to find talented management. And part of that is management that's not only talented, but even more importantly, management that has integrity. That's not just out for themselves, but really wants to do a good job in their executive position of rewarding shareholders, even people that they've never met. He says that he wants to find management that looks at their shareholders and the people that own the company as wanting to reward them the exact same as a good buddy or themselves, right? So talented management is number two. And then number three, a company that has great reinvestment opportunities. So not only is it a company that is great, that has great management, but they also have to have good growth opportunities, good areas to reinvest their capital. Finding all three of those is tricky. That's the search of a quality investor. And that's really difficult to do, but Chuck Acre has done it. So when we look at Chuck Acre's portfolio, this is Acre Capital Management. He does manage multiple portfolios, but they all basically have the same investment philosophy. 
The companies that he's in the most are ones that I'm, I'm very bullish on right now. Moody's Corporation and MasterCard. So these have those three legs. They're high quality businesses with prudent managers that have integrity and they have lots of growth opportunity, lots of international growth and areas to grow in the future. Then we have Moody's Corporation, another large holding, the second one. And then we have American Tower Corp. This is another one that he's very bullish on. He describes it as a company that does an upfront reinvestment, earns its money back quickly, and then generates continual profits for years and years and years. So the business, very simply put, is a very good business. It's not one that I've added so far, but I have been looking at AMT. I think it is pretty attractive. Visa, another one that's not surprising anyone at this point. You can see the trend here. A lot of these investors own these type of high quality companies. They own them for a long period of time. And it's a very easy way to try to outperform the market doing that. O'Reilly Automotive, this has been a big outperformer. They just funnel money into buybacks and buy their undervalued stock over and over again. The one that he bought into last quarter is the same one that we see showing up here. BN, Brookfield Corporation. So this is one that a lot of investors, these super investors are finding attractive right now. Other than that, it looks like these holdings taper off and they get very small. So we look at the top holdings here and there are a lot of the names we'd expect to see. But if you're looking for good material and old interviews of great value investors, punch in Chuck Acri interview into YouTube and just watch some of the hour long interviews. They're fantastic. He goes over how he identified all these great companies and how to outperformance over the past decade. It's really, really cool stuff to see. Now, next up, we have Daniel Loeb of Third Point. He manages around $6 billion. He's another one that's on Twitter all the time, giving his take on different things. Sometimes he says funny things on Twitter. Overall, I think that Daniel Loeb is a good investor, but I have not seen a lot of outperformance over the past 10 years. Most of his outperformance came 20 years ago towards the start of the fund. And it's actually been trailing the S&P 500 for about the past decade. And then when I look over his holdings and portfolio, it also seems a little bit of a you know, shoot from the hip strategy. I'm sure he has a good thesis on all of these companies, but it's such a mismatch of different companies in all different industries with all different types of moats and valuations. I just don't understand, or at least I can't reverse architect the methodology behind this type of portfolio. Now, if I look over his activity to see what he's been doing over the past quarter, I filter by the biggest change of the portfolio. He bought AIG, American International Group, 5% of the portfolio. So that's the biggest buy. Then he also bought into Microsoft. So I can get behind the Microsoft buy. Other than that, it looks like he was one of the ones to do the arbitrage play with Twitter. So he probably made some money doing that. And then we have another buy of international flavors and fragrances. I'm not familiar with this business. My first impression is that it's probably, it's probably a competitor to McCormick the spice and flavor maker. We can punch this one into Qualtrim and quickly see what this company actually does. Together with its subsidiaries, it manufactures and sells cosmetic active and natural health ingredients for use in various consumer products in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East and greater Asia. It's a flavor company. A lot of people aren't aware, but not every single food company makes their own flavors. They go to companies like McCormick or IFF, this company, and they say, hey, make a really tasty flavor for this new cracker we're making. And then they design and they manufacture and they make a flavor that gets people addicted to it. So I get the business thesis around these type of companies. I think they're interesting. Not one that I'm particularly going to be buying anytime soon. And then another one he bought into was Bath and Body Works. See, I, I just don't understand uh, these buys. Maybe there's some overriding thesis to it. But again, to me, his strategy feels a little bit like shooting from the hip. I, I don't see any type of cohesive strategy. For that reason, I consider Daniel Loeb interesting to look at. I'll look at what he's buying and selling, but I would not organize my portfolio at all to mimic what he's doing. Now, next up, we have Christopher Bloomstrand, who is a value investor. He's one that has studied Buffett beyond what I think most people have. He has an in-depth understanding of Berkshire, and I'd recommend looking up one of the podcasts where he goes over that because he really breaks down the company and he gave a lot of insights that I've never seen before. New things that I learned, which I love learning new things. So Christopher Bloomstrand, he's a great investor. He's also a great teacher. His fund has performed really well the first half of it. The second half, it's basically kept up with SPY. So overall, I think decent performance and he tries to follow Warren Buffett value investing. Now, my actual favorite part of Christopher Bloomstrand is his Twitter account. It's where he goes to basically call out a lot of BS that people do and people say. And he, he got a lot of attention, a lot of popularity on Twitter 
by doing this tweet storm when Chamath Palihapitiya was selling all of these SPACs to different retail investors. And he basically called out so many flaws with the logic and everything that Chamath Palihapitiya was doing. It was a, a written tongue lashing. There's no other way to describe it. And I think that a lot of what Chamath was doing at the time was in line with just a huckster selling these garbage SPACs to retail investors that are unwittingly buying something that's going to go down in value. Now, having said that, Christopher Bloomstrand's portfolio mimics Warren Buffett's in a lot of ways. First of all, he just has a lot of it invested in Berkshire Hathaway. He believes the company's undervalued right now and that it's going to continue to have growing operating profits year after year after year. The growing operating profits that are intelligently reinvested back into other great businesses is growing the intrinsic value of Berkshire Hathaway year after year after year. So the stock price might not reflect it in the short term, but Berkshire probably will compound at a quicker rate than the S&P 500. So he has 35% of the portfolio in Berkshire. He only buys it when it goes on dips. And then the other part of his portfolio is a lot of other value-oriented companies. Now, if we look at his activity last quarter, the biggest thing he did was sell his 3% stake in Allegheny Corp. So he sold out of that and he bought a little bit of Disney Maybe he bought that during the low. So that was probably a good buy. Disney ran up so far year to date by like 20%. So I think this was a very good buy from him. This is probably a good sell. And then he also bought a little bit more of Berkshire Hathaway. So he still loves Berkshire buying more and more of that company. So overall, I think he has a defensive, very value oriented Buffett like portfolio. And I think the most interesting thing he does is on Twitter. So if you want to follow him on Twitter, he has some interesting tweet storms about Kathy Wood's ARK Invest that reveal a lot of data and information that I think investors would benefit from, as well as other popular investors. So you can check that out as well. Now, last but not least, we have Michael Burry. One of the biggest misconceptions about Michael Burry is that he's a one-hit wonder that got the 07 housing mortgage crisis right. But other than that, he's basically wrong all the time. From 2000 to 2006, Michael Burry returned 200% returns, while the S&P 500 did 6% returns. So even prior to his big bet, the big bet in 2007, he made 200% returns, widely outperforming the S&P 500. Since then, he's, he's made lots of calls, some of them correct, some of them wrongly timed. A lot of people had different opinions on him, but let's go ahead and take a look at his portfolio. Let me go ahead and just say right up front, I think Michael Burry is another person that is in the category of too difficult to follow. By the time you try to mimic his trades, by the time you try to buy in and copy what he's doing, he's already sold out. The companies have already gone through their investing thesis. He can be very short term with his holdings. He buys them, they run up 20%, he sells them. So he's not the type of person I'd ever try to mimic his investing style or investing thesis. I think you're more likely to get yourself in trouble than make any money doing that. When we look over what's happened over the past quarter and we look at his portfolio, let me just run through some of the companies here. We have Black Knight Incorporated. I have no clue what this company does. We have Coherent Corp, another company that I have no clue about. We have a couple Chinese plays, Alibaba and JD. I'm familiar with those company. Then he has Wolverine Worldwide, WWW, MGM Resorts International, and then SkyWest. These are all new companies that he bought. All new. This is what I'm saying when you can't copy Michael Burry. You would have had no clue that he bought one, two, three, four, five, six, seven new companies. He turned over almost his entire portfolio just last quarter. So you cannot copy this person. Now, when I go through these holdings that he just bought into in Q4 of 2022, let me map this out. It's actually pretty exceptional. We look at the first one here. He bought in sometime around here and the stock went up. Generally speaking, he's probably up on this company. All right. Well, we look at the, the next one here. He bought in right around here and the stock is up pretty big from where he bought. We look at the next one here. We have Alibaba. He bought in sometime during this quarter right around here and the stock is up big. We look at the next one here, JD, another company that he likely bought in sometime around here and the stock is up pretty big. He's probably in the green on this one. This is another one that he probably bought after the fall here and it's gone up 
20 or 30 percent since then. His next one, MGM, this is another company that he bought in sometime around here, and the stock has gone up at least 30 percent with this buy. And then the last one here, I'm assuming there's a decent chance he bought in right here. Knowing Michael Burry, he waited for some huge crash, bought in during the fair, and had the stock go up. Most of the companies, when I look at the list, almost all of them have gone up 20, 30, 40 percent uh, since the time that he would be buying these companies, since last quarter. But again, if you tried to copy these companies and buy into them now with the information that we recently have, he may have taken gains in all of these companies. He may have wiped out his entire portfolio. In fact, he just recently tweeted, sell. So he probably sold most of these companies by the time this gets reported. So although I think it's fascinating to take a look at his portfolio and look at how he's continually able to identify companies that have been oversold and buy in right at the bottom before they rebound, this is not a strategy that I think I have the capacity or skill set to replicate. I don't think I have it in me. I don't think I could pull this off. There's other strategies that I think I might be able to do well, more like the Christopher Hone type of strategy. This is not one that I think I'm going to be able to pull off. So. If you invest like Michael Burry, I think that's incredible if you're able to do this continually, but that's not the route that I'm going with my personal investments. Now, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed looking at all these great, interesting investors. I hope you learned something from the video. If you like these type of videos, let me know in the comments below, and I'll do more of them in the future. Have a good one.